The crowd standing, cameras flashing, and Rivera cool as a cucumber. Rivera's on the mound. He has saved 23 straight wow. postseason games. Mariano Rivera, who remembers fashioning a baseball glove out of cardboard, looking to finish the World Series at Yankee Stadium. No one's been able to touch it. So that is the best security blanket you can possibly have. His manager Joe Torre says he's so automatic it's almost boring, and I love it. Let's start with some, go back to Panama. Yes, sir. Um, you've played some organized baseball f for a few teams there. You've, I've heard you say that was where you've really got your first equipment. Yes. Instead of the cardboard boxes and the fishing mm -hmm. nets and the fishing balls, you got equipment baseball. when you made the organized teams. Yes. What were those games like? What, what were they, was it good competition? Was it a lot of kids? Was it just a few games? How, how did that? How did that experience go for you? Well, Mark, uh, uh, that experience was special for me. You know, that's the only game that I knew how to play. You know, I mean, the only competition that I saw. You know, few games, no a lot of games, no a lot of kids. Uh, competitive that you have to be because it w there were no many kids. Uh, so you have to be, you have to have some talent to be part of the team or the nines that were playing on the field. How old were you when you were first? Oh, what was, there I remember, I started when I was six years old. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I was able to uh, kind of like grow up with the guys that I was uh, playing, but also at the same time, I was a little taller than the kids that were my age. So I was able to compete with older players. You know, I was competing with guys that were, if I was six or seven, eight, I was competing with guys that were 10, 11, you know? So I was able to uh, to be, uh, uh, to learn faster, to grow faster in the game because I was able to play with all the, all the boys. Kids who are growing up in the Dominican or Panama now have some big time major league players that they can look to and, and draw inspiration from. There weren't that many players from Panama in the big leagues when you were growing up. Rod Carew was obviously the yeah, Rick Rick was, there. was his star. There's a drive to left field, base hit. There's number 3,000 for Carew. Yeah, you know what I mean? And then when I was uh, on my teens, there was uh, Berenger, right. Ogilvy, you know what I mean? Obviously, the one that we followed the most was uh, Roberto Kelly. But uh, I didn't have, if I have, I would lie to you for if I tell you that I have a player that I wanted to follow, Panamanian or non-Panamanian. You know what I mean? I want to just, I don't want to be a, a, a professional. Well, I wasn't looking to be a professional player. I wanted to be a, a Pelé. I wanted to be the next Pelé. You know, and uh, uh, the Lord put me in this path and opened the door for me and then baseball. Although I always played baseball too, I was more uh, leaning into soccer than baseball. Though when I got hurt, uh, my ankles, my knees, both eyebrows went cut and I said, no more soccer for me. <laughs> Let me lean to more baseball. And the Lord picked shoes for me and then uh, I was able to compete at a, a good level because I always, like I said, I always was a part of the team that were representing our hometown, Panama Oeste. And uh, two I signed. I know you decided at a younger age that you did not want to follow in your father's footsteps and be a fisherman. Um, you didn't want to work in that industry. And, and I know you had said you thought about being a mechanic. At some point you thought about being a policeman. Um, was baseball ever even a, a thought in your mind that you could make a career out of that? No, Mark. Uh, baseball wasn't even in my wild imagination. I did play it, but I wasn't looking for uh, professional baseball. I didn't know much about professional baseball. Although I know about the big leagues and all that stuff, but I was real naive when it comes to all that stuff because I can care less about all that stuff. I just wanted to play the game of baseball. You know, so, but I wasn't looking for a professional uh, uh, career or something where I can make a career out of. You know, yes, you say that, you know what I mean? Uh, I wanted to be a, a mechanic, auto mechanic, because I mean, I, I, I found that fascinating. 
to me I like arts and uh, obviously uh, what I did what I was doing at the time I was trying to save some money to to go to, back to school and learn the trade and made my shop you know and then uh, police my cousin was a police my uncle was a police uh, few of my uh, the friends on the on the neighborhood was police, so I said, you know what, uh, let's let's go, then make a shot of it, and we went, and that was '89. Me and my cousins and some friends went, and uh, like a week after, uh, U.S. invaded like Panama, and everything was broken. So, you know, that's purpose of God, because I mean, He has just a plan for me in different ways that I wasn't even looking for. And, uh, you know, now I can understand what was that, but back then, you know, it was kind of a little hard. And uh, especially again, you know, when all these things happen, you thought, well, my career, there it goes. You know, because someone came and destroyed my dream. And the leader I knew was that God already has something different for me. Did you have exposure to big league baseball? Was it on TV? Did you get to watch it ever? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to watch it on TV. Yeah, I got to watch it on TV. Yeah, I was exposed. But again, I wasn't into, I see guys now, I have a nephew there. My God, this boy breathes baseball. He dreams baseball. He eats baseball. He sleep baseball. He's all about baseball. You know, and uh, he doesn't have that much talent, but he loved. If it was for the the desire to win, to be in the big leagues, he would have been in the big leagues a long time ago. But I wasn't like that. You know, I was just, I was making my ball, making my glove, my bat, and let's go at it on the field. Forget about watching TV, especially in the summer. You know, back then, the days were longer. You know, and for us, we have the whole day to play baseball. Baseball, soccer, whatever the sport was. But we always were on the field, on the beach, on the, uh, we call it the end of the road, where it's a culture that we did. After that was a, a, a play where, a place where they fixed the boats and all that stuff. So that's, that was another field for us. So I was always getting in trouble. You know, just playing the game, breaking windows, breaking windows, car, with, you know, but, but we always were there. So I wasn't looking, or I wasn't uh, uh, moved by, oh, I wanted to be like this. Yeah, when, I was, when the, the World Series happened, that's when I watched the most. I wasn't watching or doing season. I watched the most in the World Series. And, uh, but that's it. In 1989, <clears throat> you were seen by a couple of scouts, Chico Heron and Herb Raver, when you were still playing shortstop. Mm -hmm. And they both said you were very athletic, you played a really good shortstop, but they didn't think your bat would translate to the big leagues, and that's why they weren't signing you. Did you think your bat would eventually have caught up? Well, I mean, uh, I would say so. Why? Because, again, I play few few games during the year. If I would have dedicated myself to that, maybe it would have happened. You know, but I never think like that. You know, I think, well, maybe. Maybe to me, don't say six. You know what I mean? So it was, again, the right plan and purpose of God. Because, yes, I was there and I was at the, I mean, uh, I, I, I played all positions. I played the outfield. I even caught certain times, you know, pitch, but not that I love to pitch, I hated it to pitch because I wanted to be on the field. I wanted to be, you know, in pitches you throw and you sit. You throw and you sit, I didn't want that. But uh, the little that I knew, you know, the Lord has a purpose for me as a pitcher, you know? So I went there again as a pitcher. I was throwing the ball, I didn't know how to pitch. You know, 20 years old now, you know, and they saw me again. When that happens and Herb says, the New York Yankees want to sign you, is that an easy decision for you? I mean, it wasn't a lot of money, I think $3,000. $2,000. $2,000. Yeah. 
Uh, was that an easy decision to say, I'll take $2,000 and go to a new country and try this out? Yeah, although I didn't know what I was doing. You know, because again, you know, everything happened so fast. Every day, Monday, I went to, tr to do the tryout with Chico Heron. Saturday, Chico Heron and Herbie worked, were, they worked together, okay? Herbie was the boss of Chico Heron. Chico Heron was a scout in Panama. So Chico Heron, uh, Chico Heron sees me on Monday. On Saturday, Herb comes, see me pitching against Panama national team. Sunday, I was signed. So everything happened so fast that I was saying that I didn't even have time to, to think or to ask, hey, how is this? How this happened? How, how, where I'm gonna go? Or all these things that was new to me, you know? So I was just, when I approached my, my father or my mo and my mother to tell them, hey, there's a gringo that wanted to come and uh, 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 talk to you guys. And I went to my, my, my girlfriend's, uh, house that's my wife you know I mean uh, uh, I wasn't even I won't say happy or content or I just took it just like that you know and, uh, again maybe because I didn't know much about it because I wasn't looking for it. maybe because I mean uh, I was naive when it comes to professional baseball you know that I wasn't uh, that enthusiastic, that, that, that move by, I mean, it wasn't the dollar because I was making more money than that, you know, but uh, I took the opportunity. So you do the tryout Saturday, you sign Sunday. How long until you're on that plane going to Tampa? Uh, I would say maybe a month. I supposed to go to Dominican Republic, but since I was 20 years old already, uh, Herb, uh, find me a, a, a spot in Tampa and he sent me to Tampa instead of Dominican Republic. Uh, but the crazy thing about this during that week that I was signing that I remember now uh, was that uh, I was just the filled in because I wasn't the guy that they wanted to come and see. There was a guy named uh, Luis Parra and another guy that they wanted to see. And for me, I was just kind of like the fill in. If they have time, I will see you. If not, well, thank you for coming, you know? But again, the Lord have just opportunity, open opportunity for me that no one can close, you know? And the rest, uh, when I went to Tampa, the boy that they want to see, he was one of them that came with me to Tampa and another Venezuelan named uh, uh, Alexis Santaella. He came also and we met in, in Miami. Out of all airports, right? Miami, a humongous airport. And here it's me and, and Luis Parra. No English, no, no, knowing anything about, I don't know if he flew before, but I didn't. That's my first time ever. And here I am, you know, I mean, looking for a gate. And what the heck is a gate? You know what I mean? So all that stuff to me was like different, a uh, different world, you know, that I was going into, that I didn't have a clue that was like that. Your father said that he cried when he took you to the airport that day for that flight. Um, sending you off to the United States. What do you remember about that day of getting to the airport and leaving Panama for the first time? It was, it was like a sweet and sour. You know, sweet because yes, you get an opportunity that you, that you want, but sour because you leaving your family that you have never done. You know, I mean, I was never away from my family. Uh, my, my girlfriend, my wife, you know, leaving her for the first time, you know, that was hard. But at the same time, you know, I was committed. You know, if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna give everything within my power to make it happen. That I will have no regrets. 
or something that I would say, man, I wish I could have done that different. I wish I couldn't done this. I wish I couldn't push myself a little bit more. You know, I didn't, I, I took all those things away from and just made sure that when I get there, and that's what my father said, you know, don't, we will be fine. Just keep pushing, you know, do your best. So you get to Tampa, that's for spring training? Uh, actually, it wasn't spring training, it was a standard spring. Okay. The spring when training was still in Fort Lauderdale at that, but the minor leagues were in minor Tampa? Leagues was in uh, Tampa. Okay. Yeah. So you go for the Tampa. Gulf Coast League team? For the Gulf Coast League team. You said you don't speak a word of English at this point. Not English. And every word that they teach you is a bad word. <laughs> you know, I don't know why people always take like, like, oh, proudness or proud to teach somebody else a bad word. I don't want to learn this bad word. I'm not going to be going to uh, to McDonald's at Burger King and ask, and ask, okay, I want this with a, a F word or something like that. You know what I mean? So I said, no, man, this is not. This is, this is, if this is English to me, I don't want to know English. How tough was the language barrier for you when you first got there? Mark, uh, actually, I was okay because... 90% of the players, they spoke Spanish in Stanley Spring. And I was in Tampa. A lot of people speak Spanish there. So that was okay. You know, once in a while I had to go to McDonald's and the lady didn't speak Spanish, well, I had to point like, number one or number two. If they asked me Coca-Cola, yes. Although I didn't want Coca-Cola, you know? But uh, but that's that's the way I learned, and I went by with it. My following year, 1991, North Carolina, Greensboro, North Carolina. Well, maybe 2% of the population is Spanish there. All right, and I didn't have much of them. I had my teammates, I was younger, my team were all older, and this, the one that spoke Spanish was hanging out with the older Spanish people. So I got in between them, and I said, man, I need to learn English. Because uh, I was going to bed crying. Not because of him, but I couldn't communicate. I couldn't communicate with my teammates. Although, the language in baseball is basically the same in the field. But, of the field. How, I, what, how I'm gonna tell my patient coach, I need to work on this, I need to do this, I need to do that. How I can do that? I didn't have a language to express that to this man. How am I going to tell my manager I wanted to pitch? You know, so I pushed myself to learn the language. I told, I told uh, Tim Cooper and Bob Dell, two good friends of mine in the team. Tim Cooper wanted to learn Spanish and I wanted to learn English. So I Tim, I don't care how much you guys laugh if I say something stupid, if I say something wrong. I don't care how much you laugh, but please teach me the right way. Teach me the correct way. And they never laugh and they always teach me. No man doesn't say like that, it's like this. Then on the bus, we have 14, 16 hours, 18 hours of travel from one point to point B. And we have those time to just talk, learn. And by the end of the year, I was able to have a conversation to communicate with my pitching coach, with my teammate, with my uh, manager and man. And from there, my, my career just took off. You, you taught that lesson to a lot of young players throughout your career. I remember my first year covering the Yankees, you were very stern with Alfonso Soriano about don't do your interviews in Spanish, no translator, you're learning English, I'll be here to help you if you need it. Was that something you felt was important to pass on to younger players as your I, career went on? Mark, I always believed that there was something major for us to understand and for us to learn. Because I mean, yes, we're playing in different country, country that our language is not spoken. You know, you spoke English here. So therefore, we need to try to learn the language. Even if you try and you force yourself to do it, 
you will so you will be surprised how how quick you can learn it. But when you put any doubt on yourself that you cannot accomplish it, you cannot do it. You won't do it. You know, and I always say the importance of learning English is because no one can make fun of you. No one can say something that you say. You know, perhaps let's see that you have interpret. And the interpreter, you said you'd say something to the interpreter. And the interpreter says something else. The writers will say what the interpreter says. And then when the, the news comes, you say, I didn't say that. Well, that's what the interpreter says. That's what you told the interpreter. That's, I have that fight with, with Duque. I say, Orlando, I don't care how you do it. You have to find a way to learn the language because you won't have this kind of fight. You don't have this fight with the media. You don't have this fight with the interpreter because what you say is what they're going to write directly, not what a B person told the writers, you know? And I always mention that and I always was tough on them because I wanted to learn the language. You, uh, you said that when you did your tryout or when you would pitch in Panama, you were just throwing, you didn't know. When you come to the United States, how, how, do, how long did it take you to learn to pitch? How long did it take you? Did they teach you other pitches? What was that process like to actually learn how to become a pitcher instead of just a guy up there throwing the ball? Well, Mark, that's the first thing that you do. That's the first thing, the, the first step that, that happens as a pitcher, you know, you, they see you throwing and they can pick up right away that you are a thrower, you're not a pitcher. And then they start teaching you the ways of pitching. And uh, it was amazing, yeah, they taught, they taught me different pitchers, you know, and I was able to, to do that. My mechanic was so free and easy, so I was able to, to apply it to all those pitches that I was learning. Although in the manual list I did, in the big list I didn't throw too many pitches, different than fastball. We'll get to the one later. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yes, that was the first thing that they uh, that they uh, that they worked with me was I mean the uh, the art of pitching, and uh, I got fascinated with. Mariano comes in, you know it's one of your worst nightmares. You got three outs left, and you got the best closer in the game coming in. He struck him out. He struck him out on the cutter. You said in, in Panama you didn't play a lot of games, the organized teams. Your first year in the Gulf Coast League, you would think that the level of competition was as good as you had ever seen. I didn't know this until I did this research. 52 innings, one earned run in the Gulf Coast League that year. Was it as easy as it looks like it was on paper? What was that? What was the transition, the adjustment period for you in facing even low level professional hitters and having that kind of success right away? You're facing great hitters. You know, the level of competition that you are, it was the highest that I've ever been. You know, remember, I, I came in from Panama where the higher the aspect, the baseball that I played was just a, prof a, 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 a amateur baseball in Panama wasn't just like you seeing you seeing college guys, you seeing uh, guys uh, from other countries, good players, you know, and that to me was the highest. But for some reason, it was just like I was playing back home. You know, I see it like, hey man, you know, this is the game that I love to play. You know, I'm playing with guys that my same height, uh, obviously stronger than me, but my abilities were almost the same. I was seeing guys fielding, I was seeing guys throwing as a man. At the beginning, when I saw the, the, the height, those guys, six, seven, we have some guys, six, seven, six, eight, big, or two, 300 pounds, 250s, strong like a rock. And then I saw the ability, how they run, how they say, oh, man, I, I think I can compete with these guys. You know, I'm, I cannot be, are competing with the power that they have or the strongness, but the abilities, I think we can, I can catch up and, or make up from everything else that I don't have that they do have, you know? And that's the way I took it, you know? And then, because I was playing more game, my speed was developing. You know, I got more speed on the pitches and uh, 
I got I got stronger and everything, you know, got better. And I cannot explain how that happened. Uh, 50 song innings, one, one uh, end run. And I, I was the best in minor leagues in, in, in earn run through a no hitter. Seven inning, no hitter. But it's only because the grace of God. Only because God was in the mix. Only because God brought me to all that. Because God opened the door for me to enter. And he was putting, guiding my path to every way, to the big place. Because of me, if I tell you that that was me, I'd be lying to you. Yeah. My abilities weren't good enough to be there, period. First of all, my abilities were enough to play back home. Yes, just leave it like that. When you get to the minors and you have coaches and instructors, which you had never had professionally in, in Panama, were there any coaches or anybody who was specifically helpful to you early on that really, that you point back to and say, that, that person really helped me early on? There's a man called Mark Schiffler. Mark Schiffler was my pitching coach, my second pitching coach in minor leagues, in Richmond, North Carolina. I got Trey Hillman as my manager and Mark Chifflet as my pitching coach. I left it. Wasn't even a righty, I left it. But he, for some reason, we we kind of, you know, lied with each other. He he was, you know, he played professional. So he, he always, you know, I'm a guy that always, you know, fascinated when people tell stories, you know, especially about life. You know, I did this, I did this, and you know. And he was those, he was one of those guys and he teach me, you know, the way of pitching, but also, I mean, to work. Let's work on this, let's work. He always calling me, Mariano, let's work. Let's work on this, let's work on this, let's work on this, let's work on this. And he put a lot of that on me that uh, I used for my rest of my life in, in baseball. You know, he was a, a, a great influence in the minor league. Uh, for me, they made they build the platform that I can uh, move to the different level. Your first four years in the minors, you have a lot of success. ERA is under three every year. Was there a point during that time where you thought to yourself, "I can get to the major leagues"? Mark, uh, again, I was just playing the game. I didn't, although that was my goal, but I wasn't like I'm. I'm, I'm I see my, my peers or I see my guys or, or guys from Panama, fellow Panamanians or, or the minor league leaguers or the big league guys, they, they always mean, I wanted to be in the I wanted to go to the minor league, I wanted to do this. And although, yes, it was in the back of my mind, I wanted to, obviously I wanted to go to the big leagues. But I wasn't like, oh man, I have to do this to get there. I have to do this. I was just enjoying my game, you know. If I told you that I was pushing to get to the big leagues and pushing and, and if I fall and I hurt myself, I was devastated. No, I got surgery. My third year as professional, 1992, Tommy John. Well, it wasn't Tommy John because uh, they didn't took no ligament in order for my body to put it. It was the, my, my, my medial clavicle ligament was down on the elbow. They move it up, touch it to the bone, and that was it. And the guy told me, hey, Mara, you need surgery. I said, well, it's, it's, that's what we need to do to, to fix it, get better. He says, yes, well, let's do it. You know what I wanted to think about? You know, let, let's do it. You know, I was that because I wanted to play the game. You know, the rest of it came, came with the blessing. You know, I mean, yes, but I wasn't like, like other players were to get to the big leagues. 1994, you have your first rough stretch. Your ERA was 581, six starts in AAA. Um, do you recall what, what that was like to, to struggle for the first time in your career? Oh, yes, uh, yes. I mean, I did because, I mean, again, shoulder, back shoulder, you know, uh, trying to go through it, trying to go through it. I mean, I was getting better with the, uh, with the, uh, with the surgery. So I was trying to push through those soreness and those pains. And uh, it was it was tough. 
But at the same time, I kept pushing. I kept pushing. I kept pushing. You know, because in that point now, I said, well, you know, I'm going to step to the big leagues. You know, I'm not going to stop now. Whatever it is, I'm going to do because regardless, I'm going to enjoy my game. If the Lord allowed me to get to here and been successful, I think that I can continue pushing. This soreness will go away and eventually I get stronger. We see what happens. Back in those days, George Steinbrenner was very well known for trading his prospects for veteran players. Were you ever worried about getting traded or was that just sort of whatever happens, happens? Again, I think I know the you know, answer. <laughs> I was so naive when it comes to all that stuff. I wasn't even worried about that stuff. You know, if you got traded, I didn't know that they can do that. I said, well, if it happens, it happens. I wasn't even worried about that. I wasn't even aware of that stuff. You know, I, I didn't read no paper. I didn't watch no TV. When I was watching TV, it was a movie. I don't want to watch a game. I play enough game, enough baseball on the field. I don't want to be, I don't want to be watching another game, you know. So that is how I was, you know. I mean, I find out that they wanted to trade me when I was in the big leagues, when I was already having a, a little success in the big leagues. Jim Michaels, oh my, you know that this happened. Uh, why didn't you? He says, well, because I, I find that you were throwing this and the other song, the pitch ball here and. and the rest of history. So at that time that you almost got traded, they wanted to trade you to Seattle for Felix Fermin because Derek wasn't playing well to start that season in spring training. Do you ever think about what if, the, I mean, if that trade happens, you may not ever be a closer. Derek may never be the shortstop of the Yankees. The entire course of baseball history is completely different. God is order and God is perfect. God's ways are perfect, you know, so uh, one thing that we did, it was just play our game. We didn't ask Derek did and myself did. We never worried about things that we didn't control. You know, we were so focused on doing what we need to do. You know, Derek was, didn't give him that job. He earned it. All right? He proved it. It wasn't that he was the best happy there, but he was as the best desire and willing to get better every year. I was the same. I wasn't worried about where I was going or why. I just wanted to be in the big leagues. I wanted, now I got into the big leagues. I wanted to stay here, you know, and I would do whatever it takes, you know, and uh, uh, everything worked because God made it that way. You know, so I'm a, I've never been a person that, uh, again, I said it before, I don't think about if, I don't think if uh, it should have happened. I don't think that ever, what would have happened if, you know, I mean, hey, you know, I would say if my grandmother wouldn't die, she would have been here with me. You know, so it's, 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 it's life. You know, it's, it's, it's ways that the Lord has for us and we have to accept it. And we have to move on with what we have. You say you never think about if. You, you come up to the big leagues as a starter. Struggle, 1995, you get sent down, it brought back up, and eventually they move you to the bullpen. Mm -hmm. Did part of you want to prove yourself that you, I can be a starter, let me let me have that chance? Or when they said no. you're gonna go to the bullpen, you said, fine. Fine. Simple, Mark. I'm always being a man that like to simplify things. Never try to, to find, oh, why this? why I was taking uh, away the opportunity. No. Remember, I wanted to stay in the big leagues. So if you tell me, Mariano, you don't go, you're gonna be no, more, no longer starter. You're gonna be a long reliever. I, I would say, man, thank you. Thank you because I still in the big leagues. I will gladly do that. During that 95 season, you and Derek were sent down on the same day. What do you remember about that day? Oh my God. We were, uh, we were devastated. We were uh, almost in tears. I remember uh, being sitting in, in uh, Benny Gans, in Inglewood, New Jersey, right by the hotel that we were staying. And uh, the feeling that we were feeling that, that day, we didn't want to feel that again, ever. 
and we push ourselves. We say we don't, we wanna, we're coming back and we're gonna come back for good. We're gonna give our best. We don't, we don't, we don't stay in our minds. We did that enough. We come into the day. And sure enough, we did. But that moment was difficult. It was hard. It was tough. Because we never been sent down from no, nowhere. Minorly, we always went up. You know, in all the sun. Yeah, we both together the same day. If you ask him, he will tell you it's my fault. I think Mo gave up some runs and they sent me down just because Mo gave up runs. So we've sort of been together the whole time. It was my fault because they sent me down. I didn't do my job. But uh, but uh, it was something that uh, we both had to go through to understand you know, the abilities and the capacity that we have to get better. 1996, you have your big breakout season setting up for John Wetland. Uh, finished third in the Cy Young Award, which was unheard of for a setup man at that point. Um, given the way 95 had gone, what changed for you in 96 that allowed you to have that breakout season? 96, 95 was, I think the end of 95 was the, the, uh, the starting point of everything. You know, because in 95, I remember I was the long reliever. And uh, by the end of the career, uh, the end of the year, I was doing good. As a matter of fact, they put me in the roster to the playoff. I thought that uh, I don't have a chance to do that. They put me in the roster, Chuck uh, Buck, uh, show up, they put me in there, and then uh, I won my first game in the playoff as a long reliever against Seattle. You know, and then uh, uh, the rest of the innings that I threw was good. So that transfer to the uh, 96 uh, season, I got stronger. Now my shoulder, elbow is good. It feel great than before. So obviously with that, the speed increased. So I was throwing now 96, 97. 98 miles per hour fast. So I was able now to compete with the big guys. You know, and in, in 96 just was a, a year that I, I will never forget. And uh, kept me, again, the Lord opened that door that no one can close. You know, because I was doing that with one pitch. You, you had the taste of your team losing in the first round of 95. What was 96 like going through that? that first October run to the World Series? Five, first of all, 95 was amazing, but sour. It was tough. I remember coming from Seattle when Game 5 was playing, they beat us, and man, it was, it was horrible feeling. Well, we took that to the next level. 96 was, uh, again, a special year where uh, I star as a long reliever. Buck Whitman and Jeff Nelson were the set of guys. Well, sure enough, within a month into the season, I became the settlement. In Wetland, me and Wetland, we did so good that we won, we went all the way. We won the championship. Inches away and the count stays three and two. Another chance to the left side. Hayes waits. The Yankees are champions of baseball. Amazing team. Amazing team. So, you know, I was happy. Just because, I mean, I was able to win a championship in my second year in the Big leagues. I mean, a lot of players play their whole life and never get one. You know, and here I am in my second year. Uh, I, I have one ring in my hand already. It's amazing, you know. And uh, that was that was powerful. You know, I felt good. It felt like every every work, every extra work that we did paid off. After that season, Wetland leaves as a free agent. Joe and Mel make you the closer. What did that mean to you? And was it difficult at the beginning of '97? I think you blew three of your first six saves. Was that difficult adapting to that role, or how, how did that go for you? Well, at the end of '96, since I did so so 
I did so good. Uh, I wanted to transfer that to the 97 season. You know, all the song, I became the, uh, the New York Yankee closer. I wasn't looking for that, you know? But yes, they gave me the opportunity. And sure enough, you know, uh, uh, everything is going south. Going back, I was looking like uh, I was moving and looked like I was moving in quicksand. You know, all the sun, Mel and, 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 and Joe come into the office and say, Joe this, say this. Joe said these words. Mariano, as long as I'm here, you're going to be my closer. I knew, I knew that if I, I don't do my job, I won't be his closer. I don't care what he says. I won't be the closer, you know. But that is, I guess that's what I need to have, to feel he had my back. And from there, I just took off. From that moment, I took off. After that day, after a few days after that, the Lord gave me that famous speech. It gives hitters nightmares. You go up to the plate against him, and it's a broken bat, especially if you have left-handed. April 97, April. you're playing catch with Ramiro Mendoza in the outfield, and your cutter just appears. All of a sudden, the ball just starts moving. You don't know why. You don't know how. How long did it take you from that day to realize this is a really good weapon for me here? <laughs> was like, it immediate? It or? Was, no, it wasn't immediate because I was petrified. Closers. <laughs> They have to know exactly where the ball's going, where you're throwing the pitch, what the ball is doing, and be in control of that. I was in control of that. I had no control of the pitch. You know, now the pitch that I throw from six years to that point is no longer there. It's no longer there. So now what I do? I come to the mound, throw in the game. Now here's Joe Girardi, comes to the mound, throw the ball straight. I said, man. I'm throwing it straight, Joe, but it's, I don't know what's happening. Catch the ball because I don't know what, I don't know where the ball's going. You know, I mean, it took me years to to learn how to use it, years to to figure it out. You know, but I I never stopped. As a matter of fact, myself, Mel Stalomayer, and Mike Borsello, bullpen catcher. We went to the team, we got to Detroit, we went to the stadium, and we were working almost 45 minutes, okay, to make the ball stop. I, we don't want the ball to stop, to, 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 to move. Because, no, again, it's no control. And we did everything within our power and our knowledge. Mel is telling Mariana, do it like this, and this ball should never move. It will go straight. As soon as I threw it, it was even harder. It moves even more. So I said, man, man, just leave it like that because I'm, I'm getting tired. And I've been throwing a lot of pitches and I got to pitch tonight. So just leave it like that. From that, thank God that that boss didn't stop moving. From that moment to the moment that I retired, I threw the same pitch. The only thing that I did different was that I, I learned how to throw it. Years after, I learned how to throw it outside corner, up and away, and up and into the hitters, you know. But it was the same pitch. So it was the same grip as your regular fastball that you had been using for years before that? The same grip as a regular fastball, forcing fastball, that I was using since I was six years old. I know you've called it your gift from God. Oh, it, no doubt about that. I, could you, did you even try to figure out why is this happening? How you just said, I'm just gonna, this is what it is now, I'm going with it. That's it. I can figure it out. Even if I sit now and I start thinking, man, but what happened? What did I do? Did I do something wrong? Did I? No, the same way. You know, it was because I just became the New York Yankees closer. I need something special for me to be successful. The Lord wanted to give me a platform that no man can give me. That's why he gave me that pitch. I learned how to use it to be effective and to bring glory to his name. That's the reason why he gave me that pitch. 
he was and that doesn't that didn't start there it started when i was 20 years old and i had signed for the new york yankees throwing 87 miles per hour the highest maybe one or two the highest average 85 miles per hour at this time if it some men at 20 years old throwing 87 the highest average night average 85 mile per hour looking for a job as a professional baseball player he got no shot zero shot but yes here i was you know the lord opened the door and he made it wider when i got to the big leagues giving me that pitch i never doubted because I understood there was something different. It's no man has teaching me this. And this ball was moving like, but you saw it. You know, I was surprised at times how that ball moved. You know, I, that pitch make big leaguers look like they never played the game of baseball. When they were swinging at that pitch, it looked like they don't know what they were doing. And you're talking about the best of the best. Mark, you're talking about guys that come from all over the world to the United States of America to play the best baseball there is in the world, okay? And that pitch make them look like they have no idea. I mean, I, I can be that smart. I cannot be that smart. You probably broke more bats than you gave up hits. I would love to have the, those numbers, that's the distinction. I would love to have that because, man, there were times that uh, uh, I break. I broke this guy, Ryan Klesko, I remember in the World Series, 90, 98, 99, 98, 99. 99. Oh, San Ryan Diego? Was... No, again, Ryan Klesko, 99. Because he played for San Diego and Atlanta. So it was no, 99. Atlanta? Okay. 99, Atlanta, I think. Three times in the same at bat three bats and didn't break like just break i mean they shot it like, pieces of wood all over you know i mean that pitch was something special what does it feel like to be able to throw a baseball and shatter a bat it feels good <laughs> it feels good yeah, it's, it's, it sometimes it looks like the bat has like a a, a piece of a, a little piece of dynamite or some type of explosion they when the ball made contact with the bat explodes. you know i mean it, it worked for my advantage but sometimes it didn't you know i mean uh you have to take the good with the bad you know what i mean the bad with the good you said these are the best hitters in the world so they know what's coming and they can't hit it were you ever concerned that they would figure out how to hit that pitch again when that time came, if it came, we work with it, you know. But I was uh, told by many people, Mariano, you have to change this. You have to do something different because you cannot be in the big leagues and throw that same pitch and be successful with. At some point, the guys will catch up to it. I said, well, when they catch up to it, I make the adjustments. You know, a wise man told me this once. His name is Whitey Ford. He says, Mariano, don't try to change the ways that you get someone out. Even if you got it out for 20 times the same way, do not try to change it. May him adjust it. May him adjust his ways. Because if he don't, why are you going to change it? And that stuck in my brain and in my soul and in my heart, like I remember today. Why did I have to change something that is working? Why? If I answer suffer with that, well, the moment they make adjustments, okay, the game is about adjust, okay? I will adjust to that. But if they don't, why I'm gonna be the guy that has the success and make the adjustments? It's been foolish. It makes no sense to me. And so that's what I did. You said years after you first started throwing the cutter, you figured out how to work it in and out. Do you think figuring out that command to the point that you did helped you play as long as you did? Yes. 
Yes. I was able because now you don't see, although it's the same pitch, just you don't see in the same way always. You know, I love us have to change. Uh, 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 you you cannot be only diving for the pitch there to catch the corner going from the middle away to the play. That's what the right hander was doing. So I, I start the ball inside of their hip so they cannot uh, go toward the ball away. When I start doing that, I'm more establishing that pitch inside and I still have my outside corner. You see, so I was able now to make that adjustment with the same pitch, but I did make adjustment. And yes, and after that, I threw more two seamers. So I was making adjustment, but using the same pitch. So, I mean, that's exactly what I did. You used to joke with us in spring training that you were working on your change up. That yes. Every year, that and was I our did. joke. I remember one time, the only time I ever remember you seeing throw it, Ryan Howard in a spring training game, and he looked like he had no idea what to do with it. Did you ever think about using it in the game in, in the regular season? More. Uh, did you ever actually throw it in the regular season? I did once. Once. To, uh, man, what is his name? A right fielder for Gary Anderson. Garrett Anderson Garrett for the Angels. Anderson for the Angels. Foul ball, foul ball, foul ball. So you know what? I'm going to throw a change. Pop up to the left field, to the right field. I always work in spring training with the pitch. It was successful with it. You said Ryan Howard, all that. I was successful with throwing it. Every time that I throw it, it was something different that they never saw. And they swing at it. You know, but I didn't feel comfortable with it. You know? So I tried to make it perfect in spring training but I didn't feel comfortable with it. So if I don't, com I don't feel comfortable with it in strength training, surely I ain't gonna bring that to the season. You know, I'm always on the line and I don't wanna get beat by my second or my third best pitch, my fourth best pitch. I don't want it to. So therefore, I, 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 didn't, I didn't continue using it. You know, I didn't, I didn't feel like it, you know? And, uh, Tell you the truth, I, I don't think I need it. Because when I needed it, I threw the pitch. You know, I said, man, okay, I have that, but let me use it then. And I got the guy out. But, but uh, more were the, my uh, bats with other, other hitters were, were fast. They either get a hit or I get them out quick. You know what I mean? So I didn't have a chance to battle with guys like throwing 10, 15, 10, 12 pitches, eight pitches. No, it was quick. So Garrett Anderson was the one. Yeah, Garrett That's Anderson good. was the one, yes. People forget that your first two plus years as closer, you didn't have your Enter Sandman music. You just came into whatever they were playing. They tried Guns N' Roses a couple of songs, and eventually they got this Metallica song, and they decided that was the one. Um, did you even realize at first that they had turned that into your music? I never knew. I never knew that because, uh, uh, Mark, I was so concentrated. I was so, so focused on what I have to do that I didn't, I lost a, a, a control or time where we were or what, uh, who was there, you know, what they were doing. I can care less about that. I know that I had to do a job. I know that I had to go there and get three guys out, six guys out four guys out, five guys out. And that's, that was my my mission. I didn't, I didn't know who was playing, what kind of music was playing, what was playing. I didn't know that. I know that the fans liked it because every time that I, when when the, the music started, before I got into the door, people went wild in the stadium. That's the only reason, that's when I noticed it. But after that, I was going through the field with no clue what was going on. Only one thing in mind, and that was getting those guys out. So at no point did it get to the point where you'd hear that music and you would know it was time to pitch and you would get, did it ever get you pumped up or nothing? Nah. 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 You know, just the moment got me pumped up. We would get pumped up when we heard it because we knew the game was almost over. Tell you, yeah. <laughs> That's what a lot of fans say. <laughs> but I wasn't just that easy. You know, I mean, maybe, 
maybe looked that easy, but it wasn't that easy. You know, you're talking about facing the best of the best. You know, and every time the, that I was there, I was bringing my day game. I was prepared. I was prepared mentally and physically. No, not physically 100% because I never was 100%. No player is 100%. But mentally, I was 100%. I was prepared and I was giving my my 100%, my best. So that those things I did. You said you you were not a Metallica fan. You don't listen to that kind of music. Yeah, uh, I never I never was a Metallica. I mean I, I, I mean I, I never was just I mean I don't listen I didn't hear to music uh, like that. You know, wow, not like that. You know, I respect the guys. I met them when I met them. Uh, uh, you know, great guys. But I told them themselves as a guys. Don't ask me too much question about this because the answer will be maybe things that you don't want to hear. But I was honest to them. I don't want to fake it. Oh man, I love the music. No, I don't like the music. I don't hear that kind of music. And I listen to Christian music, you know, and they ain't not playing no Christian music, you know? So, but again, it was good for the fans. The fans love it. And uh, I just left it like that. Did you come to like that song eventually? Well, I mean, uh, uh, to hear it, you know, but uh, I don't even know the words, to tell you the truth. But again, it was some, it was, it became part of me, you know, and, uh, and uh, again, uh, uh, I was okay with it. For all the success that you had in your career, 652 saves, five World Series, everything else, you had a couple or two or three pretty big high profile losses in the playoffs, 97. Uh, 01, 04. What did you learn from those that helped you succeed afterwards? And not, you know, a lot of times a guy has a, a bad, you know, 97, the Sandy Alomar home run, somebody gives that up, especially the first year as a closer, they may not necessarily recover from that. And then you went on this crazy run after that. Mark, 97 to me was the only one that I, that I uh, said, man, this was teaching me a great lesson. The, obviously, my first year as a closer, when you come to do this job, you have to make sure that you have to minimize the mistakes. You know, uh, hit a mis he hit a mistake, he hit out of the ballpark. In the right field, well hit. Track, wall, tied. So I didn't want to feel that again. So I was making sure that when I go to the outside corner, I miss in the outside corner. When I go into the inside corner, I miss in the inside corner. And that was a must for me. I had to learn how to execute better. And I, that motivated me to get better. You know, I had my chance on 98 against the Cleveland Indians again. You know, this time I was able to be successful. A bouncer out in front of the plate. Rivera pounces on it. On to the World Series. I understood that that was just like a stepping stone for me to get to the next level. Because I never looked back. I never looked that as a defeat. I took it as a learning process because that was the way I was. I never took defeat as, oh my God, this is what I do now. I just lost this. Like, I can't sleep. I can nah. Yeah, okay. I learned that I cannot do that. I learned that this is possible to happen at any time if you made that mistake again. So therefore, don't do it again. 90, 98, 99, you guys win the World Series both years. You don't give up a run in the postseason either year. 2000, you don't give up a run until halfway through the postseason. You had 28 games with a .65 ERA. You guys win three straight World Series championships. What was it about those situations that seemed to bring out? As good as you were in the regular season, you were that much better in the postseason. What was it about October that, that really seemed to bring it out of you? You said it, Mark. You said October. No, it wasn't April. It wasn't July. It wasn't September. It was October. And not just uh, uh, beginning of October. It's the mid of October when you're playing for the cream of the cream. You know, you're playing for the best. It means playoff. And when playoff happens, not too many have the opportunity to be in there. I was blessed that I have 
a lot of opportunities to be there. You know, I want to take the best crack at it. I want to bring the best of me. I don't want to fail short, or I don't want to say, you know what? Like I said before, I wish I could do this. I hold back. I shouldn't hold back. I never hold back. Playoff, I didn't hold back a bit. You know, and that is to me, that is where uh, uh, those numbers show like that because I mean, it's not tomorrow. You have to give you everything at that moment, and you have to bring your best at that moment. You know, so playoff to me brought my best. You know, I wanted to be in that position. I wanted to be the guy that be throwing the last pitch. I wanted to be the guy that I, you know, is staying on that mound for game four or game six or game seven, and is standing up and said, it's done. We won. You know, I was able to do that. Just other times we got beat. You know, 2001, we got beat. Hey, we almost, we almost rob it. We almost steal it. But God didn't want it to be like that. Because it was it was amazing. I mean, the things that happened on the ninth inning, I can still comprehend it. You know? The things that happened, I never throw the ball away. You know, ball away. I have to me my to me one of the best third baseman and close guy that I always want on my team. Scott Brushes. And Scott Brushes, here's Joe coming out. We need one out. Okay. Scott Brushes, I'm covering third base. Stay there. Jay Bell, great bunny. But he was like a total running. Bunt straight up. Grab the ball. Deliver the pitch to Scott Brushes around the chest. And Scott Brushes never took the first base. We would have double play. The game would have changed. Right there, the game would have changed. But it happened. I cannot be mad of Scott Brushes. Why? You know, that's, that's the game. You know, so... I understood then that, man, something, something is not clicking here. Something is happening. We lost, yes, I lost this series, and uh, it was hard. But I asked my two best questions to myself. Do you were prepared? Yes. Do you, bro, you 100%? Yes. Okay. I can sleep comfortable. They flat beat us. They did everything better than us, and we almost steal it. They scored more runs than us, and we almost steal it. A lot more runs. A lot more runs. <laughs> so, so, you know, 2004, we got a lot of opportunities. We got the opportunities, and we didn't finish it. Something happened. Something happened. Game three, we scored 20-some runs. Their spirit was broken. Their life was broken. Everything that they breathed was broken. Everything that they 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 uh, was about was broken. But something happened. A rain. We had a rain now. And we never was the same thing after that rain now. When I saw that rain, I said, you know, I didn't like it. I didn't like this. For some reason, I don't like this. Because I always believe that when you have someone down, you have to finish. I don't say that we, don't, we couldn't finish it in the next four games. I couldn't say that. But if you seen the games, how they develop. And the only game that they beat us was game seven. Well, everything was almost extraneous, extraneous, extraneous. You know? And that day, that, that rain out, it was something that they can recover. It made them, okay, you know what? Let's start doing one by one, this like this. I don't know what they were thinking, but I assume there was, that was the way they were. And they ended up beating us. We didn't lose it, they beat us. You know? Your, uh, your teammates, guys in the bullpen with you, guys on the, on the position players, always said they, were, they admired your mental skills and your, your mentality, your short memory, all that almost as much as they admired your physical skills in the cutter. Did that personality, that mental approach to the game come naturally for you? Or was that something you had to learn 
as you were coming up through the I think that ranks. was I think that was in me natural because remember I was able to play on my on my young upcoming six seven years old nine years old I was playing with older guys than me but I always wanted to be the guy that took the last swing they throw the last pitch they took the last shot they kicked the last ball I always wanted to be involved I always was you know what I mean? if only if I have the opportunity only if I have guys yes we're gonna do it we're gonna do it. so I was just pushing so in somehow that that mentality that preparation I was able to apply it in a bigger stage but it was the same game that I was playing down there you know yes older but the same game with better players but the same game you know so the adrenaline and the passion that i have to be on that position was the same in a different level but it was the same so i was i think that i was exposed to that early in my career early in my life like i said therefore when i was now facing the same situations in different level again uh it seems to me like I was there before. What uh, what did Mel Stoudemire mean to you in your career? Mel Stoudemire mean the world for me. I mean, when it comes to my career, Mel was there to to help me, to push me, to allow me to make mistakes. I remember that uh, after I, I believe it was '98, we won the World Series. He took me to instructional to work out, to throw less pitches, be on the strike zone, throw less pitches, and allow the guys to help me, meaning make contact with the ball, more ground balls, more double plays, you know, less pitches, long career, longer career. And when I did that, I was able to start throwing 10 pitches to any, seven pitches to any, 12 pitches to any, you know, because where we work in previous year. And from that, I believe that my career was longer just because that, because just that little tweak that we did, maybe it was like three, four days in, in, in church number. That was enough. So I mean, okay, you ready, we're going, you ready. See you next year. That was it. One of my favorite career highlights of yours had nothing to do with your pitching. It was the night of your 500th save. You're at bat, the base is loaded walk. The only RBI of your entire career. What do you remember about that? Can you believe that? <laughs> I mean, I remember they were, you know, two outs and the guys kept getting on base, kept getting on base and I mean, the other, uh, the next guy in front of me, I said, man, this guy, three walls, something, he walked. Bases loaded, two outs. I believe we were winning by one run, something like that. And there I am, facing uh, Kayra. And the first pitch he threw right over the plate, I swing at it. He got a good cut. Maybe that took him like, hey, man, he's swinging. You know, and he started throwing here, throwing there, three, two. He walked me. I'm like, oh my God, he walked me. I can't believe this. You know, and that's how I got my RBI. You know, and, and, and on top of that, my 500 save. And that should do it. There is Cano to Teixeira, the 500th save for Mariano Rivera, the second in history to reach that plateau. It was an amazing night. You know, all alone, you know, I never, I never thought it would develop like that. You know, at that day, that, I, that within that day, I will have my 500 save in, in my first ever RBI. <laughs> it was amazing. 2012, you come into the season and in your own head, you've decided this is my last season. Then you have that knee injury in Kansas City. What made you decide, what was so important for you to come back in 13 and pitch another year when you had already decided 12 was going to be your last year? Well, Mark, yeah, 
You said it right. I mean, only few players, my friends, you know, Gary and the rest of the boys, they know my wife, obviously my agent. And, uh, and this has to be something with the spiritual life, okay? Because I did everything right in baseball. Everything with impossible in baseball. And uh, the good Lord knew that uh, that was my last year. And he didn't want me to go out like that. So he allowed me to get injury to realize, man, I, I didn't want to go out like this. I didn't want, I didn't want to go out that the last scene that you seen of myself being laying on the grass on the outfield of Kaufman, I don't know if it's still, it's still the same name, in Kansas City field. I don't want to see that. At the same time, you know, I have nothing to prove to nobody. You know, I have a great career. And this easily, I can take it, you know what, guys? This is it. But the passion in me, the respect that I got for the game of baseball, for my teammates, for the organization, for the family, didn't allow me to finish there. The Lord didn't allow me to finish like that. The Lord wanted to take me in a different door, the front door, not the back door, the way I was thinking. I was thinking, yes, like you said, after the year, the last time that I, the last, the minute that I throw my last pitch, I will say thank you guys very much, but this is it. He didn't want that for me, you know? He want me to, to go out from the front door to the whole world telling them, you know, this is it. And I was able to say that, and by my surprise, all the teams were able to honor me. You know, that's what the Lord wanted it for me. I was able to go out on my own terms, to go out from the front door, not to the back door, like a teeth, teeth or something like that. You know, for me, that was something that I, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy, guy, because the, the process, the rehabilitation to get in the position to compete at the same level that I was doing for 18 years previous to that, it wasn't easy more. You know, a lot of tears were shed because the pain was unbearable. But here is the willing and the passion and the desire to do it. And I did. I was able to accomplish that again. There were times where it says, you know what? I don't miss this pain. I don't need to go through this. You know, I'm 43 years old. What I wanted to be pushing to what? To show that I what? You know, I did everything that I could do, but there is a passion pushing me, pushing me. I cannot live like that. And I didn't. And I was able to come back at 13 and uh, have a good year because I did have a good year. And, uh, but this time I was able to tell the world in spring training that I was living. So, and I was able to do something, Mark, that uh, I wish every player does, does, is that I was able to talk to those behind the scene, those that work on the ground crew, but the outside, not the inside, those that take care of the bathrooms, those that take care of the, the hallways, those that have those sweets clean, those that prepare the food for, for all those fans to come and eat. I was able to, to tell them, thank you for what you did for me. You allow me to play the game. You prepare the way for me to play the game. I was able to do that and man, it was, it was one of the beautiful moments in baseball that I did, that I had. You also got to pitch one more All-Star game. I also in, have. In New York, not Yankee Stadium, but it was New York. 
what was that what was that like for you to be able to soak that in in your in your adopted hometown mark oh my god that all-star game it was something that i always remember not that the other one was special but this one was extra 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 special remember going through the doors or the boop into the game and then uh, warming up warm up look around there's no one on the field just me and the catcher all the sun just uh, just me the catcher Perez just left and I was on the mound alone see to my right seeing the uh, the best of the best of the American League standing applauding for me so to my left the best of the best of the National League standing in front of the dugout both teams applauding for me and 60,000 people on the stands sharing applauding man that was I never seen something like that before in my career I never and I, I was in at that time 12 All-Star games that was my 13th All-Star game and I never saw something like that. I saw guys uh, uh, going away, uh, car creaking, I was able, and uh, never saw something like that. That was impressive. To me, I was shocked. I said, man, this was special. I was able to experience that too, you know, for my last time in baseball. So 2013 for me was a special year that the Lord allows me to go out in a in a great way that I never seen it before. And then of course your final game at Yankee Stadium, very emotional on the mound. Andy and Derek come out. Did it hit you while you were out there that this was going to be the last time, or how, how did it, what was going through your mind? It hit that? me. It hit me in the eighth inning when I came back in through the eighth inning. Got maybe an hour or two in the eighth inning went back to the uh, dog girl, then went to the uh, to the trainer room. And uh, that, uh, when I was sitting in the trainer room, it seems crossed my mind like a picture, like a movie from 1990 that I left Panama to all the process that I went through to that point. It was amazing. And then when I go to the mount, I got the first guy out, the second guy out. I said, man, this is it. We were out of the playoff. This is it. He said, the last time that I, the last time that I would pitch here at Yankee Stadium. You know, and, and, and now I, I all messed up. Now my, my, my heart, my mind, my body, everything was messed up. Everything was crumbling. That was set. And, uh, to, to top that out, here is my two brothers, Derek and Andy. You know, I wish I could have Georgie there. He wasn't there. So that moment was the icing on the cake. That moment was the moment in my career as a baseball player. You know, having my two brothers standing with me on the mount and closing my career. That was special. That was special. I mean, uh, even if I couldn't write it, it could never be that good the way it happened. You mentioned Andy, Derek, Jorge. What was it like? You guys won a lot early in your career. What was it like to win that last title with them in 09 and be able to experience that one more time nine years after you had last done it with them? It was, uh, it was amazing. It was amazing, Mark. I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, and maybe sometimes you take it for granted because, I mean, we were in the last World Series every other year or every year. The first, the uh, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, and then 2003. Then lost to the Red Sox 2004 to the, to the uh, World Series again. And then we didn't see no World Series appearance into 2009. 
you know, so yes, we take it for granted how hard it is to get there. But man, when we got there again, all together, all four guys together, you know, and not only got there, but win it. It was, that one was precious. That one, because again, after nine years, we are, we on top again, you know. It, it was special. All the rings, the all-star appearances, everything else that you did in your career, you never won a Cy Young Award. Finished second once, third a couple times, three times, I think. Was that important to you? Was that anything you were, that, that mattered to you? You know, uh, uh, none of those things, none of those things, I mean, I mean, I didn't say that they no matter or they important or they good, but they were on my list. Like, okay, I have to, I have to. I was doing my job. I was just doing uh, my job that the teammates allowed me to do. You know, the rest, if it happens, it happens. If no, I always say one thing: the no title or not. Uh, reward will make me better, you know, or worse. I continue being the same person, you know, because not because I achieved this, I'm better, you know, or less. Not because I didn't accomplish it, I'm less. No, I'm still the same, man. giving my same best percent that I can give him my my best, and the rest is, is just, just just a little add to the to the trophy room, that's all it is, you know? What does it mean to you that MLB named its AL Reliever of the Year Award after you? That is, that is, that is something that I, yes, again, you know, I mean, I always say that I'm a blessed man, and those are, that is one of the blessings that Major League Baseball consider, consider to make uh, an award after me, you know? And uh, amazing, amazing mark because from Puerto Caimito throwing 87 miles per hour, the tops, to all those that process monoliths, no language, no speaking the language, to New York to Cooperstown, then that the Major League Baseball consider myself to give me an award after myself. That, uh, you know, again, I just have to thank God for that because I mean, I'm not, I'm not worthy, you know, but uh, I always proud of my effort. That I'm proud of. Always will be proud of my effort. You've been retired for more than five years now. What is day-to-day -day life like for you now? Day-to-day -day life is, you know, home. I love to be home. I love to be home. I love to spend time with my family, my wife, my kids, you know, neighbors. Now we have a church, you know, that we are heavily involved. Uh, the community. It's important for me. I I took a New Rochelle as I was born in New Rochelle. You know, I mean, uh, and on top of that, yes, I have the foundation that I take in now the opportunity of the Hall of Fame to build a learning center for the kids in New Rochelle. That's what I'm doing. You know, I'm. I'm asking people to join me, to join forces, to make that happen. Because uh, I believe that uh, our kids, this generation, needs a push, needs a model that they can lean on and be like, or better. You know, so I'm willing to do that. And I ask the Lord to give me uh, strength, to keep, to keep me healthy, so I can be there for the boys. You know, boys and girls, they need a voice. or need someone to lean on. And uh, I believe that building this learning center will be an opportunity for them to shine 
and be different. You know, that they will uh, learn that yes, we can't. You know, it don't matter backgrounds. Yes, we can, and we can accomplish greater things. And uh, that's my goal. That's my goal, more that uh, I accomplish this that the Lord has put in my heart. And it will happen with the help of God first and the help of many people, many fans, because that's my goal that I wanted to, to do something where I can ask the fans and my friends and the whole world to join me on this journey to build this learning center for others, to be the pilot of many to come. Because I don't want to just take it and put it in your shelf. I wanted to be able to put it so every, everywhere else. You know, go to Queens, go to Brooklyn, go to Detroit, go to Chicago, you know, go to LA, and then to the rest of the world. Because I mean, yes, if you have a message and you have a voice, I always believe that you have to use it till you die. Just two more for you. Mm -hmm. You had your number retired, going to Monument Park. You're now gonna be going to the Hall of Fame Yankee what logo on your cap. You're one of the legendary players of this franchise. What does that mean to you when you think about the other names that are in Monument Park and the Hall of Fame? Oh, Mark, when you talk about the other names that are in Monument Park, you know, I always, when I cross old stadium, I have to cross to Monument Park. You know, I you see Babe Ruth, I see uh, uh, Luke Gary, Mickey Mantle, Jody Maggio, uh, 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 Berra, the Rizzuto, and many others. Man that I see those. And now that I have the blessing to be part of that group, I just have to thank the God again, Mark, because I mean, uh, just his blessing. I mean, I wasn't that smart or that great to be in that position. And now I'm considered, being considered one of them. It's, it's, it's a blessing. Relief pitchers haven't gotten a lot of love in the Hall of Fame through the years. There's less than 10 modern day relievers in the Hall, yet you were elected unanimously. What did that mean to you, given especially your position, and that it's not a position that's gotten great support for I, you to get every single vote? I believe that now they're seeing the job that we do, you know, in a different level. You know, I think that the job that we did, especially in the playoff, was a uh, a key for them to see how valuable a closer is in the game, in the team, you know. Uh, and that's what I believe that uh, they take taking more notice about it. Because, I mean, especially nowadays, you know, the starters have no shot to go seven or eight innings. You throw five innings, six innings, and that's it, you're a superstar. You know, because the game now is, is built on the bullpen. Not in the rotation, on the bullpen, yes, the rotation. Matter of fact, others throw the bullpen to start the game to finish. You know, so I mean, uh, uh, I don't know, I cannot say that I'm the savior of that. All I, all I can say that I'm a blessed man, or that I was able to play the game that I love, with, to respect the game to do it right. In the mix of a lot of things, I was able to, to play with passion. And at the end, the Lord blessed me. As simple as that. You know, I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't try to put many other things, but just the blessings of the Lord. Gracias, Señor. De nada, mi amigo. <laughs>